Our two featured speakers are Dr. Linda Brown right here, and Dr. Jessica Seeley. Both um, Dr. Seeley and Dr. Um, Brown are faculty members in the education department, and they have also traveled extensively, most recently to um, South America, Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. And as you can see, the title of their um, presentation tonight is Developing Rich Multicultural Relationships, Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. So would you please join me in welcoming our speaker speaker. And welcome, welcome. All right, thank you. Well, um, let me just preface uh, the presentation with why we were in South America. Um, I was very fortunate, and I see some Rotarians here that have seen part of my presentation already, but I was blessed to be part of a Rotary Exchange to Brazil in uh, May and June of this last year. and. The f one of the main focuses of the trip was uh, education, which seemed to be pretty relevant to me because I've been in education my entire career. So I spent a month in the uh, state of Minas Gerais, which is right next to the state of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, after I had spent my time in, in uh, Minas Gerais, then uh, I met my colleague here down in Uruguay, and then we toured Uruguay and also uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina. So that is a little bit of background of why we were there. Uh, just a quick shot here, come on in, of South America, just so you can kind of see where we, we were uh, while we were here. Um, here we have Rio de mm, Rio de Janeiro is right here, and Sao Paulo, and Minas Gerais is right in here. So Brazil obviously takes up a huge portion of South America. So I did not see even a sliver of the country. Uh, when A lot of times when you think of Brazil, you think of the Amazon, which is clear over on the other side of the country. But um, you do think also beaches. And I did miss Carnival, which was a week before our spring break this year. So it just didn't match up very well for me to go this year. But um, So we have Brazil, we have Uruguay, and then we also have Argentina. Just a little bit about uh, Brazil here. Uh, the capital is Brasilia. Um, it has kind of moved around in the history of Brazil. Um, it has been in Brasilia uh, since uh, the 1950s. Um, it takes up over 300 or 3 million square miles, and there are about 200 million people in the country. Um, just a little, a little photo glimpse of what what we saw while we were in Brazil, um, and again, the topic of our of our talk tonight is building relationships, and I will tell you right now that the the people of Brazil were so welcoming and so friendly. I've told people before that they were the friendliest people that I've met outside the Midwest. And, and that says a lot. Um, because last week I was in Washington, DC, and they are the total opposite. <laughs> <laughs> they are not the friendliest people outside the Midwest. Uh, so uh, here I am with one of uh, our Nebraskans, one of our, our travelers as part of the Rotary Group. Uh, as soon as we got there, they, they wanted to show us their country. They wanted us to get a great experience in their country. So they, they took us around uh, the city of Rio de Janeiro. We went to Sugarloaf Mountain. We, we went, uh, rode the tram to the top of the mountain and got to, to see what a beautiful, beautiful city Rio is. And I'm sure you're all aware of, of how exciting the the news is for Brazil uh, in the coming years. They have the World Cup that they are hosting all throughout the country this summer. And then in the summer of 2016, they're hosting the Summer Olympics. So Brazil really has uh, a lot to show off in the next couple of years. Just a shot on our way to Minas Gerais. And I'm from South Dakota, born and raised. I live in Nebraska. We really don't have anything like this. <laughs> and I was just awed by the beauty of the country. And I realized that there are a lot of 
a lot of different geographical areas of Brazil, and we did see actually quite a few. But something like this just really sticks in my head when I think about uh, my memories of Brazil because it is such a beautiful, lush country. Uh, we stopped in, uh, our first stop on our rotary tour was in Jujifora, and uh, they, again, they took us into their homes, they made us their family. And again, I can't tell you enough how friendly these people were. Um, but they, they wanted us to experience everything, so the coconut milk, um, seeing their city, going out and looking at uh, you know, banana trees, just experiencing things that we don't have here in Nebraska or in South Dakota or really anywhere in the Midwest. Again, a lot of the focus in uh, Minas Gerais was on schools. We visited a lot of schools, public schools, private schools. Uh, this school was actually uh, started by Americans in, in Brazil. And it has a very good reputation. Um, the folks that, that took us around the school, very welcoming, told us to come back if we ever wanted to, uh, to teach there, which I've seriously considered, um, maybe, maybe towards retirement I may go back, but um, the students loved us. We kind of got treated like rock stars while we were visiting these schools because they were, they were taking English classes. They were, they were learning to speak English, and what better way to learn English than to have a conversation with native English speakers. Now I wish my Portuguese was as good as these kids' English was because uh, we could have conversed a little bit better, but my Portuguese is terrible. Another example of their school, a military school. And honestly, I was a little apprehensive before we went there. I thought, OK, what, what are we going to see at a military school? But we happened to be there on the one day of the year that a general from the Brazilian army comes to inspect the school. They pulled out all the stops. They had a military parade. We got to stand with the general and uh, observe the, the, the parade. It was amazing, and the school was even more amazing. If, if I had to pick one or two schools that I would send my kids to, this would have been in the, in the top one or two. It was an amazing school. Now, since we are also from a very agricultural community, they wanted to make sure that we could make some comparisons between where we live and with, the, with Brazil. So they made sure that they showed us uh, what they do for agriculture as well. I didn't get to see quite as many um, coffee plantations as, as I would like, because I love coffee. Um, but we did, we did see some. But uh, sugarcane is a very big crop there. Not only do they use it for you know, sugar, for, for food, but their ethanol is produced using sugar, whereas ours is using corn. And from what I've read, it seems to be a more effective use of ethanol. Now, I can't say that for sure, but I have read that. Um, we got to attend a regional conference for the, uh, the Rotary Club. And again, we, we got all dolled up and we got to hobnob with, with the big wigs in, in the Rotary Club. But um, I also included this picture because we got to make some connections with uh, a big focus of, of Rotary is sending students abroad. So all of these students were either going abroad or were there from other countries. So there were several Americans here that, that we got to you know, kind of chat with. And then uh, one of these young ladies was on her way to uh, Michigan. She was going to be a foreign exchange student there. Uh, so, and we're Facebook friends with tons. My Facebook just blew up while I was there. Um, but I'm following her on Facebook. Sounds like she's having an amazing time here. The city of Uba, uh, a smaller city, but uh, home of some very, very dear friends now. Um, again, 
They took us into their homes, treated us like family. Uh, they, the government officials uh, met with us. They were very willing to talk about, that was their education minister up there, that, the lady in the first picture. Uh, very willing to talk about um, what is going on in their country, what problems they might have, what they're doing well. Um, this was the mayor of their country. And after we left Brazil, or as I was leaving, uh, you may remember back this summer that there, were, there was a little bit of unrest in Brazil. Um, a, there were a lot of people that, that wanted more for their country than, than they thought their government was providing them. And so there, there were some protests, and, and for the most part, they were peaceful. Uh, a few of them got out of hand, and, and there were some people that were hurt, which was unfortunate. Um, but after I got home, there, there were some protests in Uba, but my friends there said their mayor did an excellent job of, of sitting down and actually talking with the people and wanting to know, you know, what can we do that would be better? And then, of course, the entire Rotary Club there, um, again, treated like rock stars because we were somebody new, we were somebody different. And uh, again, such great, great people. This is what I loved. I'm a teacher. I was an elementary teacher. I was an element, el elementary principal. And now I prepare elementary teachers. And I got to be with little kids and just um, just have fun. And at that stage, they, they didn't know English. They didn't know what I was saying any more than I knew what they were saying. But it was, it was just apparent that you know, they enjoyed being in school. And we got to, to visit with their teachers. And um, I wasn't brave enough, like Desiree was here, to actually get out and do the little dance with them. But uh, they had this, this little dance prepared for us to show us, uh, you know, to show off what they're learning in school. So I really appreciate, appreciated them going that extra mile to, to you know, make us feel welcome. Tiradentes is uh, home of these beautiful, beautiful churches. Brazil has a wonderful history. Uh, it was settled by the first Portuguese came to the country in 1500. There are indigenous people there as well. Um, but a beautiful mix of Portuguese and Spanish architecture. Um, and again, the countryside, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, in Barbacena, we had earlier visited an arts school where they had um, programs in, in the visual arts and music and theater. And that evening, their uh, music program came and entertained us. And they, they sang traditional Brazilian country music to us and played their guitars. And whatever this thing is, I, I can't tell you what it is, but um, it, it makes a noise. Um, but um, but it was it was just another one of those cultural experiences that that we we just can't forget. Uh, Congonhas again, another beautiful church. Um, this one actually fairly famous within the, the country for um, the statues of the prophets, and we were actually each given a little prophet to take home with us uh, before we left Congonhas. That was another thing. They all wanted to give us some sort of gift to take home. And oh my, we had, we had tons of stuff. So I was glad that I had extra room in my suitcase because I didn't want to leave any of that stuff behind because it, it, it's just more memories that, that I can remember. Um, again, this, this one almost looks like the Black Hills. You could kind of see something like that in the Black Hills, I think. But I think the most important thing in this, especially in connection with, with our uh, talk tonight, is, is the connections. And these people are still people that I, I connect with. And yeah, some of them are Americans. Um, and that one are all Americans. But the rest of them are Brazilians. And I still think. Thank goodness for the internet and for Facebook and for email, because I visit with these people quite a bit, actually. 
<coughs> Again, visiting more schools. Um, the one in the red here was one of my host mothers. We called, we called them our mothers and fathers, even though they were like our, our own age, but uh, because they took care of us, like, like mothers and fathers would do. But we went and visited her school, and she knew we were coming, so she had her first graders make us all these little flowers. So they painted us flowers, and uh, there's a little Brazilian message. It's in Portuguese, obviously, uh, that says, thank you, welcome, for, uh, welcome, and thank you for visiting our school. And so I have those actually hanging in my office right now, because it's just a, a very nice reminder of, of the experience that I had there and, and the schools that we visited. Uh, when we visited Oro Preto, we were fortunate enough, we didn't plan this at all, uh, but there was a little impromptu parade that day uh, with the, the giant puppets here. And so we, we jumped right in. Uh, one, of, one of our hosts, she got right into it and she was dancing along with the music. And I'm not a dancer, so I didn't do that. Uh, but again, another great experience. Uh, our last city, uh, Lima Duarte. Um, I, I joked that these were my bodyguards, but um, you know, even even the, the police officers are super friendly. I mean, they they wanted to show us their city, and uh, this is kind of a funny picture because I had gone to a Flamengo game. Uh, Flamengo is a, a Brazilian soccer team, um, and so I bought a jersey. And soccer is, is huge in Brazil, even, even huger than football in the United States. Uh, so everybody has their team. Flamengo is not everybody's team. So we went, we went out for dinner one night, and it was this little pub bar place. And the bar owner did not like Flamengo. <laughs> but he liked um, this other team, I think. Tam, I think it was called. So he went into the, his back room and he got me a t-shirt for his team. And so everybody laughed and we took pictures. And then the next night we went to another bar and I got another t-shirt. And then another t-shirt. So I wound up with five t-shirts. Uh, but it was, it was a, kind of a funny story and I got lots of, lots of uh, t-shirts to bring home. Um, and then our last day, they brought us back to Rio de Janeiro where uh, the rest of the travelers, I obviously stayed in South America, but um, my, my colleagues flew home. And we wanted to make sure that we saw Cristo Redentor, Christ the Redeemer, before we left. Because if we think of Rio de Janeiro, a lot of times, this is what we think of. We think of the, the big Jesus statue on the mountain. And so they, they took us up to the top of the mountain, and it was extremely foggy that day. And this, it, it looked even worse than that picture when we, when we got to the top of the mountain. And we were thinking, oh, we've got to get these people back to the airport in time to make their flight. And it wasn't breaking, and it wasn't breaking. And so we, we had a little lunch up there, and we, we just kind of stood around at the base of the statue. And then it, was, it really was divine intervention. The, the clouds just parted, and Christ was in the was there. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And after that, the sky cleared up and we got to, to, to see the, the statue that was is so iconic and such a, a symbol of Rio. And yes, we all took our pictures holding our arms out because that's something you have to do while you're at, at the statue. Um, so after that, I flew to Uruguay and met my dear colleague. So I'm going to let her talk about Uruguay to follow you but now you have to realize he was there over what four and a half weeks almost five weeks and we were actually on this leg of the journey for eight days something like that at any rate so um, basically um, I had been in Panama for three weeks visiting my daughter who happens to live there so we were both kind of getting this uh, cultural experience mine was in um, Panama and I tried to pick up a little bit of Spanish and I had been listening to tapes for months, but I have this tenure, so what can I say? Um, so he had studied Portuguese pretty well with 
uh, what were your tapes? Rosetta Stone. Ro Rosetta Stone, of course. And I just had these cheap tapes. So at any rate, um, when we got down to Uruguay, we, um, he was kind of counting on me to be the Spanish interpreter, right? So uh, the whole country, the two phrases or one phrase we really had was donde es. Anyone in this group speak Spanish? Oh, boy, that makes me feel good because I probably <laughs> slaughtered it. But anyway, <laughs> that just means where is. And, and that's, that's basically it. So, and then all the rest of it was charades. So, well, yes, we know, you know, some of the words you probably have picked up, um, a few of them here and there. But Donde Yes, if we hadn't known that, we probably would have never gotten out of the airport or whatever. So um, we both flew into Montevideo, which is the capital city. And um, this country is an interesting little country. It's the size of Oklahoma, okay? And it's nestled between these two giants, Brazil and Argentina. And it has never really had its own economy because um, these two superpowers, in fact, it was actually part of Brazil, was it not, for a while. And um, so it relies very heavily on those two economies. But the interesting thing was they don't um, respect each, uh, each other's currency. So when we took our currency here into Buenos Aires, we had to convert everything. And so it was just interesting that they're so reliant on each other. But basically it has um, a large coastline and the country has about 3 million people, 3.3 million, and 1.3 million live in the capital city. And most of the other people live right around the coast. So we actually rented a car in the airport and drove the coastline to right about here and then cut through the center of the country and then entered back up in Montevideo and then uh, took a bus. So we tried all these different kinds of transportation, rented a car, first of all. If you rent a car in a foreign country, make sure you get the insurance on it, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and believe it or not, we did get a little bump on it in a parking lot. So, um, so I was really glad because when I got back to the airport, I said, well, I did notice that, you know, he said, no problem. So that was great. Uh, make sure you spend that extra money. And then we took a bus, which was great fun, along the coast to Colonia, which is right here. And then we took the ferry across from Colonia to Buenos Aires. Now, if you notice, there's a large river here. All of this is considered a river. Even though if you went back to the main map, you would see it looks like just a bay. But the water is uh, brackish, so that it's partly uh, fresh water, and that it gets saltier as you get further out. But they consider it a river. So we crossed, quote unquote, the river here, which took about an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. But it was a really fun experience. So we got to have multiple modes of transportation while we were in the country. But the thing that I thought was most interesting is that as we were spending our four days driving across this country, we kept going, we feel like we're in Nebraska because we went to the sand hills, right? Well, of course you would kind of expect sand because this was actually on the coast. Um, but the sand hills actually went way inland. And so we, <laughs> we were in the sand hills um, and feeling right at home. And as we drove through the countryside, does this look like Nebraska? I mean, look, even same kind of tractors, fence. I mean, we just really felt like we were in Nebraska, very rural. Um, you don't see this too often along the road, but really more of the countryside. Um, they do have a large uh, amount of vineyards in the country. They have a very big beef population where they raise a lot of cattle. Um, many other orchards also. Now I have to tell you, this is the dead of winter for them because it was um, late June. June when we were there. Sorry, I don't know why it went backwards. Um, and then I thought the next thing people would really like to know is, well, so often you know the ruts and the roads are really bad. But as you can see, this is actually a double lane highway. And this is just one of the back country roads. They really were well maintained and very safe. And I didn't ever feel 
did you, Jesse? That we were at risk while we were driving, ever. And um, <laughs> just parking, I guess. But, um, and the more of the countryside, isn't that just gorgeous? Do you feel like you're home? So don't bother going. No, <laughs> I mean, just, we're just driving through Nebraska. So what is the doing that for? Um, this is actually the capital, Monte de Veo, it, a beautiful city that I've been in lots of big cities, but this city, 1.3 million, the airport is way, way up on the edge of the city. And Jesse had found a room way downtown for us to stay in, which was kind of scary for me after I drove it. So I landed first, got the car, and I said, well, I'll just go check out the hotel, right? So two hours later of driving through this massive, along the coast, it just goes on and on. I thought, surely I'm almost at the end. And then there was another bend with another big bay. And as you can see, very modern, very beautiful, um, very beautiful really was. This is, um, there are lots of lighthouses. How many did we stop at? Five or six. Um, we, they were just high points on the coast as we went along. Um, this is Ponta de Esta, which is Miami, okay? <laughs> it is a uh, sea resort community for Argentina because Brazil has beautiful, beautiful coastline. And so they don't really come down but the Argentinas come up, and they own a lot of property. In the winter, this little city was fairly, I mean, it's a big city, I should say, but empty because it's winter. So we had it to ourselves. Um, okay, Jesse, help me with the pronunciation of this. Ponte de Esta. No, I mean, oh, the, 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 the monument. The hand? <laughs> the hand in the sand. The hand in, in the sand, in okay. English. So, you can see how large it is. Uh, this is so weird, but this is one of the attractions of this uh, particular uh, community. And so we went and we got our pictures taken. As you can see, it's winter, but the beaches are empty because um, this isn't their season. Okay, we went to Caso Pueblo. This is a beautiful, beautiful resort. Shall I show them some of the other pictures of this? <laughs> um, anyway, maybe if you want to see them. Uh, this is on the coast and it looks down and um, if it were summer, we could have stayed there, but it was closed for the winter. So we went and had a lunch there, which one little compartment was open, so we went up there, sat on the beach. It was gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Well, it's actually above the beach. And um, each one of these rooms, this is actually the front, but the back goes down a cliff, and each one of the rooms has their own little pool as you go down. Just amazing. was Sorry. a friend of Pablo Picasso. So you can kind of see Picasso's influence in it as well. Lots of beautiful art. Well, on our back road adventure now, while we were on the coast, we could usually find someone somewhere that knew enough English to help us a little. I mean, it was really not like going to Mexico or other places in Central America where you can almost always find someone who speaks English. Um, but as we ventured back through the countryside, I mean, 10 miles or even five miles uh, away from the coast, and you were on your own. So um, we, <laughs> we end up in this small little community and um, decide, well, we better have to find some lunch. And Jesse and I really don't eat very much, which is kind of surprising. He's thin, but I'm not. But um, so we had great time, you know, finding the right place to eat. But so we go into this little tiny restaurant and looking at this menu all in Spanish <laughs> and go wait a minute this looks like hamburger so let's order it so we ended up ordering this hamburger and this is their hamburger and this is a real hamburger it has ham cheese egg and a hamburger patty lettuce tomato and all the other stuff on it but this thing was like this high okay so that was our adventure uh, off the coast and they had great seafood lots of really really good food okay so then we travel to Colonia which um, which is where we took the boat which is where I got the jacket so this jacket is from okay <laughs> uh, with the um, leather from their country so all right do you want to 
start with Buenos Aires. The deal was he would go to Uruguay with me if I would go to Buenos Aires with him. So now we head over to Buenos Aires. Yes, because if we were going to be that close, Buenos Aires was on the bucket list. And I thought, if we're this close, we've got to do it. Um, so just uh, a little bit about Argentina, capitals, Buenos Aires. Um, 41 million people in the country and about, again, another million square miles. You've probably seen a little bit of Argentina in the news as well. Their, their currency has um, had a little bit of trouble in the last <laughs> few months. Um, but again, a country with, with rich, rich history. And so many of these countries uh, have experienced you know, dictatorships and military leaderships. And um, you know, they, they might be what uh, some of us would call new democracies. And so I'll, I'll get to their, their current president here in a minute. But um, of course, the obelisk, a, a very uh, famous symbol of the city of Buenos Aires. And Eva Perón has such a huge, huge influence on the city even today, uh, even though she has been gone for what, 70, 80 years, something like that. Um, but probably one of the most famous Argentinians right now is Pope Francis. Um, so of course, the city wanted to make a, a very big deal, which they should. I mean, he's the first um, South American pope. And then uh, Cristina Fernandez, uh, who you can see in the poster. And you can also see, uh, I, I don't know if, if she put out these posters or if someone else did, but I'm trying to draw some connections between uh, Cristina and uh, Eva Perón. Because again, uh, Eva Perón is still very, very adored by the country of Brazil, or excuse me, Ar Argentina. Uh, we did experience some protests. We didn't, that, that was about as close as we got, and it was more like a take a picture and get out of town. Um, I believe they told us, because we stayed at a hostel in Buenos Aires, and I believe they told us that um, they were protesting like bus fares and that kind of stuff. You know, correct me if I'm right. wrong, Linda. Yeah. Um, so I think. They had a big band, and it went, all, it was just yeah. amazing. Yeah. It seems like any opportunity to go out and kind of march against something, let's, let's take it. Um, <clears throat> This was in a cemetery, and it, it was kind of a, a weird experience because we, we went to a church, and this is a cemetery where Ava Perón is buried. So we went to the church next door, and I bought some uh, little figurine type things, and we were talking, and this guy kind of saddles up to us, and, and he speaks to us in English, and he's a tour guide. And I, I was a little leery. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, if Linda was quite as leery as I was, but um, he offered to tour us through the cemetery and show us the highlights. And honestly, it was one of our best decisions in the city because he was very knowledgeable. And um, you know, this, um, I believe, if you rubbed the dog's nose, it was good luck or something. I, I, let me add to okay, a little about our guide because he had been an engineer in the United States for like 15 years, and his father had become ill, so he went back. And um, he's extremely educated and very fluent and just very personable. And I don't think we have a picture in here of him, but he has the nice wool jacket. And he's, I mean, he looked very nice, but um, and he did. He wanted to take us to the church, through the church, which we had just come out of, which is the oldest church in all of Buenos Aires, which um, people have to pay two or three million dollars to be wed there and you have to be of the upper class to even apply to get to have your wedding there so um, and this request of Jesse's to go to a cemetery and I'm going really Jesse a cemetery <laughs> this is the highlight of our trip but uh, we didn't rent a car so we walked all over the city and felt safe by the way all the time extremely clean um, all of our travels, everything was just spotless. There was no trash anywhere. The buildings were not in great repair, but you could tell they had been very expensively built. Lots of really nice uh, wood and tiles and granite and stuff like that, but, and marble. Um, but basically, we ended up in this cemetery 
And this person was one of the princesses and Could in Prussia, I think. And she, this is on her wedding day. She was given, uh, they went skiing, and she was uh, killed in an avalanche. And the dog rescued her, or found her, or whatever you want to say. She had passed away. So if you rub the dog's nose, which we are doing, we are supposed to have good luck. Now, it didn't bring her good luck, but <laughs> any rate. <laughs> it's got to bring somebody good luck. <laughs> and of course, Eva Peron is buried there, along with numerous uh, Argentine presidents and important people, and like the church, families continue to pay millions of dollars to pretty much lease these, these tombs. And if eventually you run out of errors to, to pay this, they will move you out and put you somewhere else and sell your crypt. Yes, between to, two and seven million dollars for one of these crypts. And they're, they're pretty high, high-end crypts. I mean, one of them had a, <laughs> had a Picasso um, stained, stained glass, glass window yeah. in it. I mean, I guess if you can afford that for your crypt, um, you can afford, or your family can afford to keep you there. Um, and then the last slide, you can't visit Argentina without um, at least going to a tango show. Again, I don't dance. Um, no, neither one of us got up there on stage. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Argentina has the tango. Brazil has the samba. They did try to teach me the samba, and thank God there were no videos because it was <laughs> awful. Um, but again, being able to make the connections with, with these people, even though we did not speak the language, um, being because Americans aren't always welcome everywhere we go in, right. in the world. And we definitely felt totally welcome in all three countries mm -hmm. while, while I was there. So um, that is pretty much our and time. We did it. So we yes. will open it up for some questions. questions. If there are any. Well, in, in the country of Brazil, it, it seems like if it's a private school, it's much more similar to what our schools here in the United States are like. Um, if parents can afford it at all, they'll send their kids to private school. Um, their, their public schools are what I would consider a bit lacking. Um, lacking in resources, lacking in being able to, to afford quality teachers. Um, but when you flip it to look at higher education, it's the exact opposite. Because it seems like most government assistance is going to the colleges and universities rather than the K-12 schools. So you want to go to a private K-12 school and a public university. How are class and race constructed then? Is there like a lower class that have attended public school and are um, it depends, and there are some schools that, that even even like high schools, that are kind of like what we would consider a magnet school, where they prepare them for a career. So there are some students that go to high school with the intention of being a mechanic, or being a teacher, or being a doctor. So they they can start making those decisions quite early in life, which is not a bad thing because you know not a lot of people uh, go to university or go to college. So um, I think the, the, one of the main purposes of high school is to prepare them for what comes next, even if it's not university. I will say that on the flight down, I sat next to a woman who worked for the education department in Oregon. And she uh, had just been touring schools in DC and in basically the Northeast, um, looking at how to improve their educational system and wanting to use our No Child Left Behind, our assessment techniques in their country. Their education system is all, all their teacher college and all the schools are public schools. And so all the teacher education is done through the government. So of course, they're all done right there in Monte de Bello because that's where everybody lives. And then the, the communities far out are pretty sparse as far as their technology. But they were really working to upgrade their schools. And that particular country has a 
very strong infrastructure along the coastline, but not inland. So you find that if you stay in that coastline, you would feel like you were in Miami or you know somewhere in the U.S. as far as the infrastructure and as far as um, the technology that was avail available. We had internet all the time, every place we stayed we were able to get online and do courses and stuff. So that was nice. Um, I mentioned how nice the roads were, and that's part of the infrastructure. There were only about four roads in the whole country, by the way. So I mean, I just wanted to let you know there weren't very many of them, but they were all well maintained. And they did charge tolls on a lot of those roads. They did, yes, there were some tolls too. Mm -hmm. What's the education system like in the favelas, or is it just non-existent, or? You know, I can't tell you that for sure. Yeah. I, I, I would think that it's it's probably not quite as advanced as, well, as advanced as it would be in. So I would even wonder this, where they would have school. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. I will get back to you on that. Okay. The, the Uruguay has actually 93.6% um, uh, literacy. I mean, it's a very... It has a l huge European influence mm -hmm. in that particular country. And Brazil's is quite lower. I think their, their literacy, literacy rate is in the 20 or 30% range. Their literacy rate or their? Their literacy. But if you think about you know the size of the country, you know, a lot of this is jungle <laughs> so you have a lot of people mm -hmm. living out there that are are not in what we would consider civilization were you in some indigenous communities or was i was not and um i kind of wish i had been and you find that you know all over um in this area of, of the country and but i know in brasilia uh, after i had left there had been um sort of a, a meeting of the indigenous peoples. And it was kind of like a sit-in type um, protest that they were, they were protesting the, the treatment of their people, much very similar to what, what we have seen in our country. Um, because Brazil, when the Portuguese came, they, they tried to enslave the, the native people. Um, and that didn't seem to work because the indigenous people just would not work for these for the Portuguese, uh, and so they started a huge slave trade with Africa, and they did outlaw slavery in Brazil before the United States did, but uh, you can definitely see that influence even in the people. Uh, a lot of the people have you know, darker skin, whether it be from the indigenous peoples or from ancestors of the slaves, but. Uh, you can definitely see it's it's just a a mix of people, um, a wide palette of colors, and Brazilian people, I will tell you, are absolutely beautiful people. You would find along the coast that most of the people look very European, mm -hmm. and that as we went inland, they looked more um, indigenous. Especially in Uruguay. Uruguay didn't have the slave trade as much, no. and I feel like... Yeah. Uruguay is like ninety percent European. Yeah, it is a large um, percentage. So. And they are so squeezed. It, I don't want to say they're insignificant because they're not. But when you have those two powerhouses on either side, right. mm -hmm. um, they kind of get squeezed out a lot. Are the two powerhouses like in constant competition to be the biggest? Well, I think there is some competition. Um, you know, Especially Bra in soccer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Uh, Brazil is now one of the, is, you know, it's considered a developing country. It's, a, it's one of the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, and China. And um, they are definitely, they're a G20 country now. So they are, are definitely on, on the world stage now. They're not just this backwards little military dictatorship in South America where nobody goes anymore. Um, they are definitely a world player. They are the number one exporter of meat in the, in the, the entire world, um, mainly because they are the number one chicken exporter. But they do export a lot of beef, which I know tends to concern some 
Midwestern cattle ranchers like gonna, my father. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, at least we felt at home. They had amazing yes. beef. I mean, we went to a restaurant where all you can eat, and they had just huge, huge thing of beef. So we felt at home as far as that yes, availability. But and Brazil's also um, doing oil exp exploration off their coastlines now, because there there are huge offshore oil deposits. So. Uh, that's something that's been virtually untapped up until this point. So they've already got their their uh, ethanol industry, but they, they have all this oil and natural gas now too, that if they're not using it themselves, they can sell it to countries like the United States that use a great deal of oil. But these two big countries, Brazil and the other one, what did Uruguay do then for, what did they use for income, I guess you might say, or what kind of products do they have? They have cattle, and they have wine, and they have basically agricultural products. Um, it really doesn't freeze down there. It looks like it would, you know, but they don't really get snow. Um, they uh, also have the tourist industry because of the Argentinas that come up and bring money in. There's also, um, uh, talking to this woman from the State Department, um, a real interest um, from China in helping redevelop their rail system and thing with things within the country. So it's, um, it's interesting that if China's interested in that little country, you know, why? But um, it, it, they're just a really warm, uh, very clean culture. It's just amazing to me, having been in Mexico many, many times and feeling unsafe and we walked and walked and just would go anywhere and feel safe. So. And it's what we would call chilly. Not cold, but chilly. Well, you saw I had on a windbreaker and Jesse had on a We did actually, when we got to Argentina, I pulled out some sweaters. Weren't they kind of like sweaters? Yeah, they were sweaters that I had gotten in yes. Panama. And I said, okay, let's put these on under our windbreakers. But in, and in I the did, evening, but. I did make the comment to a, a clerk at a store. I said, I didn't expect it to be so cold in Buenos Aires. And she said, well, it's winter. <laughs> <laughs> like you stupid American. So what was cold then? What was the temperature? Oh, it was probably in the upper 40s, maybe lower 50s. I mean, it wasn't bad. I mean, We've certainly experienced far worse this winter here in, the, in Nebraska. No questions. Any other questions? Why did you decide to go to Uruguay? It was just on your bucket list? It was on my bucket list. And of, I kind of was, Jesse told me about the Rotary. And of course, I'm too old to go, sorry. But I was too old to even apply. And so I said, but Jesse, if you do this. So I kind of worked and he with him and read, proofed his stuff for him. And I said, well, if you go, then let's meet here. And so we kind of just worked it out. So it was kind of just a fun kind of thing that happened, you know, serendipitous. <gasps> Real quick, of the three countries you visited, Jesse, which would you say was your favorite? Brazil. Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. Um, because of the people. Because I have so many friends there now, and it's such a beautiful country. And after the Rotary Tour, right before I met Linda, I needed just a little time to decompress because w the Rotarians kept us busy. The entire <laughs> month that we were there, we were go, go, go. Uh, so I spent two days on the beach in Rio de Janeiro, and. It was the most relaxing thing I think I've ever done. It's just I took a book and I sat on the beach and watched the waves and and again the people. It just friendly. yeah, friendly. I have so many great memories from from Brazil that it's not if I'll go back, it's when. Mm -hmm. Nothing like Central America. How many of you have been to Central American countries? Which Costa ones? Rica. Costa Rica. As I said, all of those countries are in prison. I mean, they have bars on all their windows and serpentine wire. And I mean, it's just like you don't see that in these countries. Um, it's just, it's different. I mean, I was pretty surprised by um, how safe we felt and uh, how open they were and how friendly they were. Very low crime rate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be booking? No. <laughs> well, if there isn't any other questions, I'd like to thank both thank of you. you. Um, it was very interesting. And
I'm ready to go to South America. I don't know if anybody else. So again, thank you.